Before we get into it there, we just want to remind people that you know, we're supported through Danny Donovan at quickminutes.com. Yeah, Danny's a, a very good friend of both myself and James. He comes from the north side as well and he grew up locally and, <clears throat> you know, he's a, been a massive supporter of the podcast and both myself and James since we actually began and, you know, he's uh, he has his own company called Quick Minutes now and... And quickminutes.com is a meeting management application for um, semi-formal and formal meetings. And look, if you want to know more about that, quickminutes.com and supporting Danny, supporting us. Um, so if you're interested in that, check him out and enjoy the rest of the podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Tone Rx podcast. I'm your host, James. I'm not joined as always by my good friend, Timmy Lamb. Hi, everyone. Sean is on the light and sound. Why, Sean? Not too bad, how are you? And before we get into it, we're after rearranging the studio to make utilise our lovely vinyls on the wall. What do you think, Tim? I'm still adapting, James. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still you're, adapting. You're under the steeple there, the famous Shandon steeple. I'm looking at some of the different areas. There's corners of the room I never saw before, and there's cobwebs everywhere. So we're like we news readers, <laughs> not <Nari laughs> news or something like that. <laughs> and then our guest today is the Director General of the Irish Prison Service, Karen McCaffrey. Morning, James. Morning, Jimmy. Lovely to be here. Is that like the CEO of prisons? Effectively, it is. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Now, before we get into it, the backdrop you have here is a beautiful painting by Keith Anderson of it's from Baker's Road, which is just below Knocknaheeny, looking over the north side out into the harbour. So uh, just for people that are kind of catching the eye, that's Grana Braha Church to your right. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you go behind Grana Braha Church and up that way, the prison, and you know where we are at the moment, Mm -hmm. actually. Across the river is Montanari, and just over that hill then is Cork Prison. Okay. So uh, you'll probably be up there after anyway. I will. So before we get into the work you're doing at the moment, for the people that don't know you, where are you from, where did you grow up, and how did you get into this role? Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Castlenock in Dublin. Um, I spent most of my childhood there. Um, I'm currently living in Longford. Um, so I've been in the prison service for 16 years and the prison service decentralised to Longford. Um, and so I moved to uh, Lock, Stock and Barrel um, and I'm very happily uh, living there. And I've got a couple of kids who are country kids now. So actually, <laughs> um, I couldn't ever contemplate going back um, to a city. So really happy to be where I'm living um, and really happy to be where I'm working. So as you say, I'm currently Director General of the prison service um, I've had this role for four years now um, I'm incredibly privileged um, to be in the role and to serve our staff of whom we have over 3,500 to serve the people in our care um, who today we have um, almost 4,400 and then to serve broader society in terms of working really hard within our service to achieve better outcomes for people in our care which is to the benefit of everybody in our communities. So did you, you said you started in the prison service 16 years ago. What did you do before that? So I joined the Department of Justice straight out of college. So I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I did an arts degree, um, as many people do, uh, and followed my passion, which was English and history at the time. I did a master's in international relations, um, politics, economics and law, and then joined the Department of Justice. I always knew, I suppose, I wanted to be a public servant. Um, I think growing up, I wanted to be a teacher, um, but ended up joining the Department of Justice, spent six years there and joined the prison service. And I suppose I always saw it as accidental that I ended up in the prison service but my mum did a lovely thing for all of us when we turned 40 and she made a memory box for all of us and my dad was in the army and he served abroad so she'd saved all the letters we'd sent to him and there was a letter I had sent to him when I was 14 and studying potentially not so hard for my junior cert and talking about what I wanted to do and I was saying I wanted to be a teacher but actually I'd like to teach in prisons and um, so I've always had a strong sense of social justice and always believed that education and um, you know was a real leveler and can provide so much opportunity for everybody and, and unfortunately um, access isn't always equal and people don't always have a quality of opportunity so it's interesting actually yeah. that um, I'm in the role I'm in and I think it's not necessarily accidental and more hopefully um, you know by fate that I find myself in a role that I'm really really passionate about um, and really dedicated to. It's one of those roles as well within our society that you have so much like people are looking at you to make these changes not just the, the public in general but People like myself and James who would have been in prison before and make positive changes. So down the line, guys, see, they, they look at prison as a, a place where they can, it's, it's rehabilitation, they can learn, they can edu- get education, learn about themselves, get mental health services within there. And like, is that a big emphasis for you at the moment? 
It's a huge emphasis for me. So I have an international role at the moment. I'm also president of Europris, which represents 35 prison services internationally in terms of promoting best practice. And when I speak anywhere, both nationally or internationally, I'm really clear about the role of the prison service. And our role is not just to lock people up. Our role is to unlock potential. Mm -hmm. And what we see as our core role every day is to find the potential in people so that they can realise their fun potential and go on to have a different narrative and a different story for their futures. So um, really, really clear that our role isn't to lock people up but that a role is to unlock potential and I mean I always say and people always think that prisons you know are really grim and they're dark places and it's really really difficult but you know I think for some people they see prisons as places of punishment but I'm really clear prisons cannot be seen as places of punishment and can't be operated as places of punishment and for me our prisons are places of hope and opportunity and everybody who's within our care has a hope um, to lead a better future for themselves and their family and everybody then during their time in our care has an opportunity um, really to, to find personal growth, to find personal self-esteem and to deal with the issues that generally have given rise to their offending in the first place. So be it an addiction, um, a mental health issue, issue in terms of educational disadvantage and low levels of educational attainment, um, issues in terms of not having employability skills. So really, um, for me, our prisons are places of hope and opportunity and all of our focus and all of our emphasis then um, is about giving people opportunity because if we see our our prisons as places of punishment and our role is simply to contain people then we're not adding um, to safer communities and we're not contributing um, to a safer island because people will then leave and more likely go on to commit more offences and potentially more serious offences because prison in, is, in and of itself is criminogenic. Mm -hmm. So what we need to ensure that we do um, with people in our care is give them all of that, those opportunities that maybe they've never had in their lives before, quite sadly, um, so that they can reach their full potential, not just while they're in their care, but more importantly, that they can reach their full potential um, on the outside. So I think traditionally, maybe prisons might have been seen as places of punishment. And I think the prison service probably saw its job ending when somebody walked out the gate. But I suppose what we've come to realise over the last few years is actually people make so many significant gains in terms of their personal development while they're in prison. And it's that bridge between prison and the community that we're now focusing, focusing on and really need to focus more on because all of those gains can be lost if you're going out without strong family support, if you're going out without accommodation, if you're going out without the opportunity to further your education yeah. or training, if you're going out, you know, with an, an active addiction that you haven't um, had that's treated, it. if you're going out with a mental yeah. illness where yeah. you're not stabilised and have a bridge or a pathway into support in the community. That's a fantastic point that you made there around the, the secondary service after prison because if somebody really, and I know this and know James know this, if somebody really wants to get the help within the prison system when they're ready. There are plenty of services there. There's the education, there's personal development groups in there, there's count, drug counselling, psychology. There's so much there. I know some of the departments are really um, bombarded with so many. So, and, and that's very, uh, and I know we're, we, we'll probably talk about that in, in a bit, but I think the integration back into society Particularly if you're leaving a family, your 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 family to go into prison, and you're going back into that same family. If that family has a lot of mental health issues, mm -hmm. there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of drug and alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. uh, criminality. You don't have much of a chance if if that's the only home you have to go back into. You know, and like we're fortunate here in Cork that we have the Cork Alliance and they do help out and it, there's a safe place to go for the lads and stuff. But is there anything else that is in the pipeline maybe down the line that you, you think would be a great way to actually help the lads even outside of prison? Yeah, and as I say, you know, we've stopped seeing our role as ending when somebody leaves our care, because if we can't help people get the support they need in their communities, then they are, unfortunately, back on a pathway um, into our custody in the future. So there's a huge amount we need to do. I think communities have a huge role to play. Everybody comes from a community. Everybody goes back to a community and communities, in my view, really need to step up and become more involved um, in terms of giving people a second chance. And I know we were all at an event in Google recently, um, you know, where we had a group of employers in the room and we were explaining the importance of giving people a second chance because what I say to people is that 
people who are leaving our custody are vastly different people. Mm -hmm. um, in the majority of cases, particularly where they've spent a, a long enough period in time in prison so that we can help people um, address their issues, they're vastly different people than they were when they were committed to prison. Um, so there's a huge piece around society giving those who've been in contact with the criminal justice system a second chance. And I suppose we talk about rehabilitation and reintegration, but I I mean, realistically, um, you know, many people who come to custody come from socially and economically marginalised communities where they were never integrated into a community. And it's not about rehabilitating or reintegrating. It's finding a pathway for somebody to reach their full potential within our communities. And we can only do that with community support. So we need employers. We need third level institutions um, you know, our colleges um, our adult education centres to really see um, that they have a significant role to play for people who are coming out um, of custody to help them reach their potential in the community. And we've been doing, we've been making great progress in relation to that. I think it's fair to say we've got the Working for Change strategy, which is around yeah. um, employment. And that started out looking at social enterprise. But I always had an ambition that it needed to be much broader because social enterprise is quite a niche. But what we need employers to see is the journey of change and transformation that people have undergone yeah. in prison and also see that they have so many skills to give and that there's an incredibly talented workforce, um, you know, within our care at the moment who've got something you know that that employers want and employers need similarly in terms of third level education we've been working really closely with Minister Simon Harris and for the first time the national access plan for higher education was published recently and people in contact with the criminal justice system have been identified as a marginalised group and I think that's what we need to see more of we need service in the in in our community to see people in our custody as citizens and then for them to provide um, a, a really good service to people on their release. But I think we also need to be clear that it's not equality of access. And I was really clear with the minister in relation to this in terms of education. There's more support needed. There's more wraparound services to help somebody and to give them the opportunity. So just getting a place on a course or just getting a place in education isn't enough. What you need are wraparound services and ongoing support and mentoring um, for, for people to, to realise their full potential. Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned the term they are uh, criminogenic and people might know what that means, but just what Timmy spoke about there, if you're in an environment where there's poverty, mental health, antisocial behaviour, drug use, these all contribute towards crime and criminal behaviour and the, the word that they use is a criminogenic environment. Okay. And if you're in a landing, in a, in a prison where there's no services, I suppose because some people look at prison as like punishment they shouldn't have tvs they shouldn't have kettles but that is a criminogenic environment and that contributes to recidivism which means reoffending afterwards so what would you say to people that have the belief that tvs gyms and kettles and things like that should be taken from they should be locked up can you explain why people are afforded such comforts or maybe um are treated more humanely than others would like and how that helps to reduce crime. Yeah, I suppose we're always really conscious in all of our work in relation to victims of crime. And we know that a lot of harm has been done to people in our communities yeah. because they've been victims of crime. We can change what's happened to that person, but what we can change is ensuring that no future victims of crime are yeah. created. So if we were to take somebody into our custody and simply lock them up, not treat them with decency, not treat them with humanity and empathy and not work with them to address the issues that gave rise to their offending, more victims of crime will be created in our communities. So the reason, um, you know, we have a very humane and a very empathetic approach um, within our prisons is because it gives the person the best opportunity to make the best use of that time to turn their lives around. So where, mm -hmm. I suppose, was previously the value proposition of imprisonment was seen as incapacitation so you could take somebody dangerous off the streets um, and of course you know you are incapacitated while you're in custody but we're not going to reduce your risk of reoffending again if we don't work with you to deal with the issues that gave rise to your offending so if we don't have really good addiction services to help people um, you know deal with an addiction if we don't have incredible education services to give people it's not a second chance at education in many cases it's the first chance at education and to reach their potential and grow their self-belief and, and, and self-esteem if we can't give people work training um, opportunities that will give them skills on release for employment if we can't model pro-social behaviour mm. you know in terms
terms of all of our engagements and interactions, well, then we're not going to serve society well because we won't be reducing the likelihood of the person in our care reoffending when they're released. So our whole system is around built around humanity. Um, and unfortunately, not all prison systems are built on those, hum those, those, those principles. So I spoke recently at an international a worldwide conference, actually, um, and people were really taken aback by the level of humanity and the level of empathy um, that the Irish Prison Service has for people in its care. Um, and this conference in, was in the States, actually, and I declined an invitation to go and visit an American prison because in that prison, you weren't, offenders weren't allowed to look at the staff. They had to turn their backs to people as they walked by. And for me, that's inhumane. And if we treat people inhumanely, um, then we won't expect those people to take that opportunity, um, you know, that, that, that a sentence gives in terms of addressing the reasons that they found themselves in the criminal justice system. Yeah, but I think if you look at like either side of the water that's you know between the UK and between America, like we can be thankful for I suppose what we have. Um we all know the horror stories from Rikers Island and how prison officers, you know, facilitate violence and stuff like that. Um I was up in the prison recently doing uh we were delivering an addiction studies course and uh there's about fourteen in the group and they they commented on um the re the recruit prison officers, the new prison officers being more open and uh you know, just um having more of an understanding and having less judgment and stuff like that. But that's not by accident. That was a design of the new recruitment. Um myself and Sheila Connolly had a little input into that. But would you um explain to the people that are listening and watching well, I suppose the ethos behind the new recruitment. Yeah, so actually I was responsible for that. I was director of HR at the time and I suppose what we traditionally been recruiting people into the role of a prison officer, we were looking at security focused, um, you know, skills. Um, and again, that was because, you know, traditionally we saw imprisonment as been first and foremost around security and safety. Um, so what we did was we got some occupational psychologists to go in and spend time and landing in a prison and to find out what it is to make a really good prison officer because we know that a prison officer within the prison system has the most positive of impact on somebody on their landing and we all know class officers the whole system who are such a positive influence and who can really encourage and motivate you and support you would people often in have custody. a situation like where a, a fellas want to get onto that landing because that's the more chilled out landing that's the more relaxed landing and like a, a class officer could have the landing under control by consent because yeah. he's personable he yeah. you know, has a bit of awareness yeah. all it takes is for one officer to walk through that landing with an attitude and this upheaval you know, yeah. and so we have a really finite number of services within our prison so we have a finite number of psychologists very small unfortunately a finite number of teachers a finite number of uh, addiction counsellors and the majority of our staff are uniform prison grades so we know that if we have you know really motivated um, staff who are not judgmental so, so I suppose what we did is changed our recruitment model and we've gone for a values based approach to recruitment. So what we're looking for are people who believe that others deserve a second chance. We're looking for people with strong resilience because it is difficult working in a prison yeah. and it's not an environment that everybody um, can survive in. So we're really looking for people um, you know, who have that positive attitude, who see people in our custody, in our care um, as deserving of an opportunity to turn their lives around. And I think that's been reflected, but it's not just in any recruits, I would say. Um, you know, we have incredible prison prison officers right throughout our service yeah. and for me it's one of the proudest things um, that we have in our service is the relational um, you know, element within our service so the, the relationships between staff and people in our care in the prison system in Ireland I don't think um, is replicated in any other jurisdiction and when I have other people over visiting they can't believe the level of engagement the level of trust the level of respect and respect is a two way thing and we know that if we had good, if we have good relationships between our prison staff and people in our care it leads to a safer environment a less stressful environment for everybody mm -hmm. um, you know both somebody who's living in the environment and both somebody who's, who's working in the environment so we've put a huge amount of effort um, into our recruitment process but also in relation to continuous professional development. Um, so that's a new enough concept in the prison service. You know, previously you were recruited and you didn't get any training. And mm -hmm. um, whereas now we have a lot of training um, and we're providing a lot of training in terms of being trauma-informed. So certainly we have an ambition um, to be a trauma-informed service. And at the moment, I'm looking at restorative justice. And I think restorative justice has got huge potential um, for our service in terms of dealing with inter-prisoner conflict, staff um, conflict among staff, conflict amongst prisoners and staff. So simultaneous, simultaneous to us developing a current strategy, we're developing a restorative justice strategy um, for the service. And I think that has huge potential because prisons are about people 
people and they're about relationships. Yeah. And if the relationships aren't right, um, you know, then everything else becomes much more difficult. Right. So I'm really proud of our staff and I'm really yeah. proud of the work that they do every day within our, 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 our landings. I was just going to mention, you mentioned something earlier about um, just being new men to pr people in prison. Um, I think that's very important because a lot of the people in prison may have had s some form of difficulty in their life growing up or whatever it may have been and they may have lost all forms of trust mm -hmm. uh, against humanity really yeah. and everybody around them so um so i suppose if you were I I if they're to be in the prison and they're being treated badly like everybody else who's just turned their back on but if they're being tr treated with respect given a little bit of responsibility you know, an officer saying hello to him in the morning instead of, come on, you, get up. Do you know, that goes so far. You know, it goes so far with, with somebody. It actually shows them, you're showing them that there is hope in, in, in life, you know. There is hope and people are good. Yeah. Because the, 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 the people on the outside, for them, they may be involved in all forms of crime and, and drugs and whatever it may be. It doesn't matter. But if they're in here and they're seeing like, do you know what? There are people good. That could be the first step to them maybe saying, Do you know what? I'm gonna go up to the the the, the psychologist or I'm gonna go up to the next personal development group in the in the school or I might even do my junior sort. Yeah. You know, that stuff is very, very, very important to about being nice. No matter if the prisoner sometimes Karen and I've noticed this, sometimes you get some prisoners who are after been hurt so much in their lives. No, Let's let's be honest. There's the backstory as well. We're talking about victims, but they've been hurt so much in life that they have this angry demeanor. They have treat everybody like with, uh, you know, they're the ones we need to work a little bit harder on instead of just really pushing them to the side and absolutely, and say, you know, yeah. And I think some people have a perception that our prisons are full of bad people, and our prisons are not full of bad people. Yeah. Of course, somebody has committed an offence. Of course, they have caused harm. Of course, they've made bad choices, but they're not inherently bad people. And in my view, there is inherent good in everybody. Mm -hmm. And our job is to find that inherent goodness and to help people see that they have a value and that they have a contribution to make to society, even if, you know, they haven't seen, you know, that 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 where they can make that contribution. And you're so right in relation to trauma. So, you know, yes, people in, in, in custody, you know, have caused harm, but the majority of people in our care are victims also yeah. and victims of trauma um, and have grown up um, and been subjected, um, you know, to significant adverse childhood experiences, which then regrettably, um, you know, have made them um, much more likely, um, you know, to end up engaging in crime. So we know if somebody has four or more adverse childhood incidents, they're seven times more likely to have hurt themselves or others in the last 12 months and 11 times more likely to use class A drugs or to end up in prison. Mm. Um, and then we know that of those who end up in our custody, 60% of their children will end up in custody. So it's really, really important for Ireland and for society um, that we stop that um, cycle yeah. of offending and that we intervene. And we will, I'm sure we'll get to it later. But for me, the intervention, and, and we talk a lot about what happens in prison, what happens after prison. But for me, the intervention needs to take place at a much earlier stage in the community yeah. because there is a pipeline, unfortunately, into our prisons. Um, and there's a pipeline from school to imprisonment. And if we can focus our attention and our resources into actually supporting vulnerable families in the community, then I think that's going to have the greatest impact um, in terms of um, cutting that pipeline um, from, from, from school to imprisonment. And of course, you know, we will always need prisons. Of course, there are people who commit serious offences, um, you know, and the appropriate punishment is the deprivation of liberty. Um, but for a lot of people who come in contact with our service and find themselves caught up in the criminal justice system, it's because they have addictions and mental health issues that are related to trauma and childhood trauma. Yes, you made a great point there. And I'm just going to bring it back to somebody there that we had on recently in on the podcast. She's a judge from the US and she's Bro over in Broward County in Florida. She's over a mental health court where people who have mental health issues come into the in, into the court and they thought they might have caused some some bit of uh district court charges. Yeah. So non violent went, defences. That's it and, yeah. and uh, like I I'll, I'll leave James finish it after this point here because James James knows knows the, the story backwards but the way 
the way they manage it over there on the side in our court, you know, it's so informal, you know, it's like they walk in and she asks, how are you doing? How's things, you know, are you okay? Is everybody treating you well, you know? But back here in the course, it's like, stand up straight or whatever, you know, my experiences down through the line, they were very, it, it was a horrible place, I hated the courthouse, but do you think because we have so many different people within our prison system in this country, who suffer with the mental health, that we could ever have some form of strategy like that or our system set up where people who really, really have mental health issues go to a place like this and instead of going into the prison system, we can put them into a hospital where they can get treated properly. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was appointed Director General back in December 2018, the first issue I brought um, to the Secretary General and the Department of Justice was around, um, you know, just the high level of people who ended up in our care and in our custody, whose underlying issue was not a criminal issue, but mm. was a mental health issue. So when we look at the statistics on any given day, there's 250 people in custody who are on the caseload of the National Forensic Mental Health Service. So they're people with you know, really um, acute needs in terms of psychosis or schizophrenia. For many of those people, and particularly within our remand population, um, a lot of people end up in our custody because they're not in a position to access um, mental health services in the community. So uh, my ask of the department was that we would set up a task force working between ourselves and the Department of Health and the HSE. Um, it's great that that task force was established and has recently concluded its work. And I suppose it has three different focuses. The first is in relation to diversion. So where a guard comes upon somebody who has a public order offence or is acting in a way, um, you know, that that that, that is a, of concern where the underlying issue is a mental health issue, that the guards have the ability to divert somebody to an appropriate treatment centre. And unfortunately, what often happens is to ensure public safety and to ensure the safety of that person, they're brought to our service yeah. um, and we give an incredible service and when I link, think of um, Clover Hill Prison in, in, in particular um, and the specific landing we have to look after people who are acutely mentally unwell they get an incredible service but that service should not be provided in a custodial setting it's not a therapeutic environment and that person is generally only in contact with the criminal justice system by virtue of an untreated mental health need so there is a new pathway being developed in terms of diversion to allow the guards not to bring some somebody to the prison system, but to be able to divert them first and foremost to an appropriate treatment centre in the community. The second element of that task force then was looking at people who are in our custody and who are serving sentences um, who have significant mental health issues. So um, we're currently doing a piece of work to I suppose, identify a dedicated unit within the prison service where we would have an enhanced mental health service. So, as I say, we have a number of places within our service where the National Forensic Mental Health Service provide a really excellent in-reach service. But we'd like to have a dedicated unit that would potentially be co-managed and co-led with the National Forensic Mental Health Service mm -hmm. and would be much more therapeutic in terms of its, its approach. Um, so we're well on the way to establishing that at the moment within our service. And then the third part of the mental health task force was looking at the through care piece. And again, really, really important when somebody goes out, that they're going out into a service and that they have stability and continuity of care. So that mental health task force has recently concluded its work. And I know the first meeting in terms of the implementation plan of all of those recommendations is happening within the department next week. So there is a new blueprint in terms of how we manage people with mental illness um, within the criminal justice system. And I'm really looking forward to that um, being implemented because prison is not the place for people with severe and enduring mental illness. And on any given day, we have 14 or 15 people waiting admission to the central mental hospital. And those are people who are acutely, acutely unwell and um, who are living within our prisons and who we're providing excellent care. But no matter how amazing the care our staff and our clinicians give to those people, it's not sufficient because, in you know, a prison is not a therape therapeutic environment and we don't have the facilities or the resources that they need to get better. Hello, everybody. Just to remind you all, uh, we are in the Opera House and 8 p.m. Saturday, the 25th of March, with Jimmy Barry Murphy and Shane Casey. Yeah, two very, very important figures in Cork City. Yeah. And Jimmy company. Barry Murphy, one of the, the most inspirational sports stars we had in this city, and Shane Casey, yeah. one Billy of Murphy the characters himself. of the city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the real offender will meet the young offender, as it were. But if you're interested in getting tickets, you can just go into the description of this video. And there's not that many left either. And we sold out last year. So uh, don't be disappointed when we see you there. Yes. Saturday, 25th of March. Thank you. Next.
I was just thinking there, you know, a lot of the people that are going to prison, a lot of them have drug addiction, alcoholism, um, and whatever mm. else, they're addicted to these things. And these, like drugs and alcohol, they help people cope and it helps them to soothe and, you know, we, mm. we, we know how all that works. But when that's taken <laughs> and you're put into prison, what you're left with is the underlying issues around trauma, mm -hmm. mental health, whatever they're drinking on, it doesn't matter, you know. And, and you've people inside in the prisons like who are trying to cope with all these different things as well, you know, it, issues from the past and whatever, drawing addiction. How, how, what is the best way to, for, for the prison system to be able to deal with people coming into the prison system like that? Yeah, so I mean, seventy percent of people who come into our custody have an active addiction, be it um, drugs or alcohol. And the drug-seeking behaviour, as you know, mm. doesn't stop at the prison gate. So, like, it's a really significant issue, and actually, increasingly of late, it's a really difficult issue in terms of just the level of drugs, um, you know, that have been thrown over perimeter walls into our prisons. And where somebody, and and you're absolutely right, where you've an active addiction on the outside, and as I gave that statistic earlier, if you've got a lot of childhood trauma. You're 11 times more likely to be using class A drugs and that is to suit um, and to regulate yourself. So when that is cut off, I appreciate it's really, really difficult. But what we see, unfortunately, is a lot of people who spend a lot of their time in custody continuing um, that drug seeking behaviour and continuing, um, you know, to, to, to maintain their addiction while they're in a custody. I see custody as a really great opportunity for people. Um, to actually deal with their addiction. So at the moment, we're actually re-working um, our keeping drugs out of prison policy. Um, but I suppose we need to be realistic. So long as we have people actively using drugs in our community, prisons are just a reflection of society. Yeah. There will be people within our prisons actively using drugs. So I think the focus needs to be on, um, you know, the broader societal issue. But, but what we can do, um, I suppose, is, is enhance the services that we have to help people um, deal with their addiction. We have incredible addiction counsellors within our service and Merchants Key provide a really great service and um, we certainly need to expand that and um, we, 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 th there's a lot more we can do I think to, to, to support people we are at the moment looking at identifying a drug treatment um, unit so similar to the unit I described earlier which would be a bespoke unit and right. um, so we have got a drug treatment program um, in the medical unit in Mount Joy but I suppose the question is when somebody has completed um, that program and they go back into an environment where drugs are freely available, it's really difficult to have the motivation to stay mm. drug free. So we're looking to try to identify a facility within the estate which would be a drug free prison so that we would transition people from the medical unit when they've completed um, the drug treatment program into um, a unit where they're stable. But I suppose it's, it's a constant challenge for us to keep drugs out of our prison. So we've gotten very sophisticated at front of house. At the moment, we're investing in even more technology um, in terms of ensuring that visitors aren't bringing drugs into prison. And I do appreciate that a visitor or a family or a friend could member pressure. could be under pressure, absolutely, and could think they're actually doing something, somebody a service, yeah. um, you know, by bringing in drugs. But the reality is it's actually the opposite because we need to mm. cut the flow of drugs down so that people can see it as an opportunity. So we're working with the guards at the moment around um, our perimeter security to see what we can do to stop people mm. um, throwing drugs in. But really, it's a societal question in terms of addiction and drug use. And, and so long as we continue to have addiction within our communities, then we'll continue to see um, drugs within our prison. And as I say, you know, what we need is a much more trauma informed response um, within our communities to help people deal with their addictions mm. so that addiction doesn't lead them down a pathway of criminality. Well, back in the early days of this podcast, one of our first guests was John Lonergan, who was the Mount Joy governor for a long time. And he spoke about uh, prison is not there to judge people or punish people. They get that in court and that we're there to, you know, provide a service for them and to look after them. And uh, I think that maybe he was, um, he obviously was a very compassionate man. And he met us up in Timmy's house. We were recording at the time. And, you know, just the idea of a prison governor walking through a council estate in the north side of Cork City. But as some of the lads that would have been in Mount Joy back in the day would have said, he can do that because he treated people with respect, you know. But I think when when you treat people with respect, you can unlock that potential. There was one uh, prison officer that I had a good relationship with, uh, Miss Stack up in Cork Prison. I hope she don't mind me saying her name, but I might ask her permission afterwards. But she was probably the first prison officer, first adult really, outside of my mum and dad, 
that used to say to me, James, you have a lot of potential. You know, you're intelligent and you could do things with your life. And she used to see me coming in for a few months and going out for a few months, come back in a very poor condition, being released, you know, like a shiny penny, coming back in a very poor... It was just addiction, the cycle of addiction, and go back into the environment. And um, she she used to, you know, I suppose, give me positive affirmations, positive mm -hmm. reinforcements. You're better than this, you can do more, you have a brain, you know. That stuff stays with you, yeah. much more so than... Are you going out to the air or not? The, the typical, but if somebody just shows you a little bit of time, a little bit of a kind word, it could, you know, you, you might never see um, your planting seeds, I suppose, your planting seeds. And I say it actually every time. So I do medal award ceremonies. I've been doing those recently. And I mean, what I'm saying when I'm thanking prison officers for their service is that, you know, unbeknownst to them, they have touched the lives of so many people who've come yeah. through the system and been a positive influence and a positive role mo model. And as you say, and potentially the first positive role model yeah. that person has, has, has had in their life. And it is about respect and it's also about not being judgmental. So we do not judge anybody. Yeah. Irrespective of your offence, everybody is treated equally. Everybody is treated with equal respect. And what we do do is obviously assess a person's risk in terms of their potential to harm others or to be harmed. But nobody is judged within our service. You're right, and John Lonigan is right. The judgment and the punishment happens. Do you know what I mean? At a court level. Yeah. And when you come to us, what we're trying to do is to build you up um, as opposed to knock you back or to yeah. break you down. And I think that's really important. And it goes to the heart of the philosophy of the Irish prison system yeah. approach. And I think it has real dividend in terms of, um, as I say, unlocking people's potential. And when we look at our values as, as an organisation, one of our values is potential. And that's mm. seeing the potential of our staff and seeing the potential of everybody in our care. And I suppose everybody is bigger than their biggest mistake. And that's not just people in our care and custody, it's everybody. Yeah. Everybody has um, the opportunity to be better, to do better, you know, to work in themselves, to reach their potential, to find their potential, um, you know, and to learn. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll come to education. Yeah. But um, before but we go into the education, I want to ask you one more thing about the addiction side of stuff. So, like, uh, Merchants Ciarán provide a great service, the psychology provide a great service, but there's a finite number, as you said yourself, and there's a lot of prisoners. So sometimes, especially people that have those short sentences, mightn't get the opportunity to meet those. But what they can do when they get out is go to NA meetings. And one of the things the lads brought up to me in the prison the last time was the lack of NA meetings. And they said that um, if you're interested in woodwork, you can go to the school and go to woodwork. Or if, you want, if you're interested in crafts, you can go to crafts. Or if you're interested in English, you can go to English. He said, but for those of us in recovery or uh, interested in mental health and trying to better ourselves, we've nowhere to go. Like, we might do this course for eight weeks, but then that's gone. But do you think that there's an opportunity for... I suppose, to get any back into the prisons for to have like between myself and Timmy. And this is just thinking out loud now. If myself and Timmy went in and ran a 10 week course, then that addiction studies at eight weeks, maybe another NGO might go in and do eight weeks. But between us all together, there's no reason why every Friday in the prison is like recovery day in the school and people interested in that could actually go. And because when they get out, they might not have access to Merchants Key, they might not have access to psychologists, but they definitely will have access to the stuff that's in the community, like NA and different you know, NGOs. I think it's an incredible point to make. And I suppose one of the things we're doing now when we're looking at service design and delivery, um, I mean, I think that those programmes should be led by people who are in custody. So I meet a lot of people who've done addiction courses and addiction studies, who've dealt with their addiction in prison. Mm -hmm. And they're the most powerful influencer, I think, in terms of people who are within the environment of an active addiction. So one of the things, and we'll, we'll talk about it later, I'm sure, around our new strategy, is just looking at service design and, uh, design and delivery. And one of the things we learned during COVID through the Red Cross is that the peer-led approach works mm -hmm. best. Um, so I would absolutely um, be interested in that, but I'd want to bring it further so that we were training um, you know, people within our care to, to run those programmes themselves because you know, if you have the lived experience then you have got much more potential to relate to somebody you know, who's been you know, who's, 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 who's on the same pathway as you but maybe um, you know, a couple of steps back um, yeah. in, in, so, so there's huge potential there and definitely we'll make sure that that's a critical part of, of the amended and updated um, and Keeping Drugs Out of Prison strategy. And you see like the, the pair led stuff like the mediation service you see it in Cork started over as a traveller mediation service, but now there's set now it's for settled people as well. But I've seen like um, if you get the right people in and train them as mediators, um, tend they, they tend to be a little bit older, maybe doing a bigger sentence that yeah. the other lads will look up to. Yeah. 
they they're going they're they're resolving long term feuds, you know. Absolutely. So uh, I met I met that class um, who recently graduated in Cork, and like I'm such a strong supporter of the mediation s- the yeah. service, and then it's potential. So I mean, we're looking at restorative justice, um, as a potential strategy to be employed. And when we look at what the mediators in Cork specifically are doing in terms of, you know, engaging with new committals who are looking to go on protection, which means they're going to limit their ability to engage with services. You know, having a dialogue with those people, having a dialogue with those and um, within the prison with whom they believe there is an issue or a problem and really trying to encourage people, you know, to be active citizens within their community and take opportunity, avail of the opportunities that are there for them. So mediation and um, restorative justice, all of those practices have huge potential within our service. But for me, um, they need to be peer led. And I think there's a there's a huge opportunity for the prison service in terms of um, giving employment mm-hmm. to ex-offenders. So I stand up in front of employers and I say, give people a second chance. But I'm really clear. Um, and actually had this discussion with my senior management team um, last week. We need to be leaders in relation to this. We need to be giving employment opportunities. We need to be looking at um, design, service design being co-delivered by people either in our custody or people formerly in our custody if we want to achieve better outcomes for people in our care. How do you respond to gangland? Is it difficult? Like, I know protection can be a difficult thing to do. Like, if at sometimes then, if people have to be segregated for their own safety, but then even within that segregation, does people have to be segregated again? Is that increasingly difficult as it's, it's probably more of a phenomenon in Dublin with the gangland and stuff, used to be Limerick, not so much in Cork. But does that put an extra strain on the service? How do you manage all that? It's a huge strain on the service, but I always look at it from the point of view of the person themselves. So if you come into custody and you look to go on protection, then you're going to spend much more time behind the door. That isn't good for your mental health. Mm. You're going to limit your ability to go to school, to go to work training and, um, you know, to ga- engage in positive activities that will help you and, um, you know, develop a better future for yourself. So in Ireland, actually, and I haven't been able to find another jurisdiction that allows people to self-select to go on protection. In every other country, it's done on a risk assessment. Um, so I I have an ambition to change the prison rules actually to no longer allow people to self select to go in protection because what people are actually looking for in a lot of cases are to be with a particular group from Drimna or a particular group from Crumlin mm. or a particular um, you know category and actually you shouldn't need and, and it happens they're all in protection so you need to go in protection to fit into that group we should be able to facilitate people um, you know to be together on a landing without them having to have protection and as I say I do think uh, the mediation approach I do think the restorative justice approach um, is, is a way to go forward but it is so limiting for somebody mm. if they t- spend their time on protection because they are limiting their opportunity um, to, to use the services that are available to them um, to turn their lives around. So it is a particular problem for us and it is something that we are um, you know, very interested in resolving and it may be the case down the road that we just have one prison that offers protection because if we have five protection prisoners, we need to close the gym for 50 prisoners to bring those five prisoners. Yeah, so exactly. it limits everybody's ability um, to access services and regrettably services are finite. So it's certainly something um, that we need to look at and and that we need to address and and it's a long-term goal and again in terms of um you know the gangland issue i think is a particularly difficult issue and there are feuds and factions that for everybody's safety we need to keep separate um but outside of that um you know there are lots of people who 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 self-declare to go on protection and we really need to work with that but also we need to work with the gangland Mm. and people and it's interesting i had a conversation with a long-term prisoner recently um who sent me a proposal in terms of developing a program um, to deal with people who are engaged in criminal gangs to allow them to see a different future and a different pathway for themselves and that doesn't necessarily you know mean the continuation of the pathway that they're on so um, I think we when we're looking at you know services and approaches we need to make sure everybody um, you know is is within our 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 vision um, and that we're not you know saying just because you happen to be in a criminal gang well then you know we don't have any hope for you yeah, or you yeah. don't have a hope of a better future I think we need to be very careful and see that everybody has a quality of opportunity in terms of what we and can offer maybe maybe the prison the prison service has an opportunity to actually while people are incarcerated to actually resolve feuds that could have you know, big benefits outside as well and we've seen that happening in a number of our prisons um, certainly within the traveller cohort which, yeah. and, and I suppose that's where the traveller mediation programme started but then more broadly, mm. um, you know, within other gangs. And certainly I think there's much more potential for that. What about women in prison? So from my experience, both personal and professional, if a man goes to prison, the girlfriend will generally come up to visit, maybe bring she look after the kids, pass up 
money for tr- runners and tobacco and all these things. But when a woman goes to prison, the children can end up in care. The very seldom will the partner go up and visit or pass in money for runners and tobacco. Like, is it more complex for women? Is it a harsh or is it harder for women to do time? Is there more shame and stigma attached to it? And it, it, do you manage women and men very differently within the prison service? Yeah, I suppose if we look at the demographics um, of the prisoner population, so we've just over 200 um, women in our custody today and a significant number of those women, um, you know, wouldn't be sentenced prisoners. They would be on remand. I think it's quite a small population and I think there's a distillation um, of vulnerability within that population that you might not necessarily see to the same extent within men. So in many cases, there's addiction um, there's homelessness. Um, there is domestic violence um, and there, people can come with very complex problems, significant issues in relation to mental illness. So um, we do treat women differently because under the Bangkok rules are actually obliged to look at the specific needs and vulnerabilities of that group. And there's a couple of really good things happening at the moment. One, we've just built a new facility for women um, in Limerick prison um, and I mean, I think when you see it, um, you know, the design is the design is trauma informed and it's about a normalizing an environment where people can feel safe. And if they feel safe, then that they can take, you know, the steps and the small steps potentially, you know, to deal with the issues um, that have led them in, in contact with the criminal justice system. The issue of motherhood is really um, interesting. Actually, I had a conference with or I had a conference call with an academic two weeks ago um, and she presented at a Council of Europe conference I was on just around motherhood. Um, I'm actually we're going to invite her over to do some work with our staff and do some work with, with women within our custody because it's hugely traumatic for the women who end up in custody and they don't know where their children are or their children may be in care um, and also we need to be really mindful of the impact that has on the children and um, so I think there's a lot more we need to do around motherhood you're right to say that women are not supported um, potentially by their families to a greater extent and actually recently um, I've made some changes um, just in terms of what we can offer women from a hardship perspective and um, so we're now I mean and, and it's really simple things and um, you know a lot of women when they leave prison have no clothes and the only outfit they have is the prison outfit yeah. which is a tracksuit which it then it's identifies sad, you when you go out yeah. As, as an offender so we've um, we've brought new clothing and um, it's a proper set of clothing and um, you know we're, we're, we're giving um, you know more personal hygiene products free of charge through the tuck shop we're giving enhanced hardship payments and actually that is to recognize and um, that the needs of women are different but also that they don't necessarily have the same um, family support and a lot of women who end up in our care have really really complex needs and they need a huge amount of support and they get that support while they're in custody so Timmy you mentioned all of the services that mm-hmm. are there you know so you have a peer group you have acceptance you have friends you have stability you have routine you have access to health care you have access to mental health and um, you have access to education you have access to psychology but when you go back to your community you don't have the access to those services so really what we need to start focusing on and I, I think I mentioned this earlier it's the transition piece back to the community and it's how our communities can support really vulnerable people with complex problems so that they don't continue um, you know just to, to, to revolve within the criminal justice system. Do you know the restorative justice part of it so I think that's powerful I think it's powerful because um, you, you might have a victim sitting across the table from the, per- the person who committed a crime and I think it's very important as well and it's very healing as well for a victim to be able to speak to the person who committed a crime and tell them how they actually felt and how they're still feeling today and I think that p- that can happen only when say for example not when Timmy went into prison initially it only can happen when Timmy's after doing a bit of work on himself and he's aware and he's not using drugs and, you know, he understands now that his behaviours weren't great. They, they, they didn't know and justice, you know, including himself. So it, would, it, would it be something like that? You'd be able to work out... It, it, do, you ever see, do, you, do you ever see something like that ever happening with the victim? I know we've spoken about how it could work within within job roles and within the prison talking to each other but 
do you ever see it happening with victims of crimes? Absolutely. So the probation service actually are leading the way in terms of restorative practices between offenders and victims. And I think there is huge potential because I suppose, and I mentioned earlier, the best way the prison service can serve victims is to ensure that no future victims of crime are created. But while people are on that journey, while they're in our care and accessing services to learn more about themselves and why they've ended up in the criminal justice system, there is, a, I suppose, a realisation then of the harm that has been caused to them um, and then the harm that they've caused to other. And I do think it's important in terms of um, reparation. Um, so we do a lot, you know, and you'll know this, that, that there's a lot of activities that happen in prison for charities uh, where people want to pay back the community and make a reparation for the damage that they've caused. So I do see potential in terms of the restorative practices between offenders um, and their victims. But that would obviously need to be victim led and people would be need to be really comfortable and not all victims um, you know are comfortable engaging in that process but certainly it has potential and I think there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of benefit not just for the victim but the person for them themselves to have a realisation that actually they have caused harm um, and to understand that the impact they've had you know on an individual or on their community because I think that can be really powerful in terms of desisting um, you know and making different choices um, in the future that doesn't end you up in that pathway where you're causing harm to your community or to individuals within the community and also causing harm to yourself and to your family and potentially somebody's children as well. Yeah, it's like this, it's, it's, it, this is a division I just had in my head there. It's like I'm sitting across the table for you, you robbed my house, are we going to switch it around, <laughs> vice versa? Um, and you're telling me how you felt, telling me how, how your children felt, your husband, how... Um, how your grandmother's ring that you had for the last three generations is gone you know how that made you feel you know um you're not really worried about the money it was some of the prized possessions that she had that would hit you yeah that would hit me like a ton of bricks yeah and whether i go back using drugs or not and i've no drugs the next time i feel like i need to get money for drugs and rob someone's house it's going to bring me back to that feeling that I felt while that person was telling me exactly how they felt during the the, the start of just a practice um, mm -hmm. meeting. I think that stuff is really, really power, powerful, but there is there there is a lot of kind of quirky bits around the edges that need to be fixed to yeah. make sure everybody's safe yeah. and they're be minded during the whole process, not just during it, the lead up. The after, I think there's even an aftercare kind of section that you yeah. might need for it as well, yeah. where Absolutely. you're meeting with counsellors individually because that's a, a big deal. And I think you probably even need somebody in the room mediating yeah. it, make sure. Because that's when you're meeting somebody that is bringing up an emotional experience from you from the past where you felt mm. a lot of anger and hatred towards somebody and they're sitting in front of you, it can get quite intense and they can wait even, do you know? So, yeah, I, I think it could be very powerful, but I think there are other ways for us to help people see the harm, you know, that they have caused in the hope that, do you know what I mean, that they can reflect on that. So there are different ways I think we can do that um, in terms of people telling their personal story, um, you know, within a group in terms of, you know, people who've been through that process as an offender, you know, sharing, um, you know, the, just the harm that's been created. Um, but there's definitely, I think, a huge amount of potential. You're right, it needs to be very carefully done. But I suppose for me, what's most important is that somebody, while they're on their journey to recovery, recognises that they have caused harm to their community, to their family um, and to themselves and that they make that determinated effort then, um, you know, to try to right that wrong, particularly with themselves. And you may not be able to right the wrong. You may not be able to, um, you know, change the harm that's been done. But there is a different pathway for the future. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really important is that we we're focusing people on the future and giving them hope and different pathways so that that isn't an inevitability in terms of a cycle of behavior for somebody's mm -hmm. life, because Definitely. you might have caused harm in the past. But if you can recognize that you have caused harm and the impact of that, not just on the victim, but on the wider community and your own, um, you know, family and community, I think there is real potential then um, in terms of people making different decisions into the future. Yeah. So, yeah. Some of the flack we get sometimes is about uh, what about the victims? You know, what about the victims? Which is, listen, we have to take that on the chin. 
But I suppose for myself and Timmy, we can't undo the things we've done. But what we try to do with our lives today is to, I suppose, make an amends in a general way for mm -hmm. society and to, because this is obviously shown in prisons as well, to show people that are currently in prison that there's a different life there for you. Um, you can rebuild your life and redefine who you are. And our goal really is to have less victims in the future, like exactly. you spoke about. And a lot of the people we have on the podcast to have the personal story, they're all victims as well. Yeah. Like, the, yeah, they ended up in prison later in life, but when you hear about the abuses, the neglects, the violence, the different circumstances that they've been through in their lives way before prison became into their life, they're all victims too. And sometimes uh, crime and prison is just a symptom of all that other kind of victim stuff as well. But I suppose myself and Timmy was able to redefine our, our lives really through education. And it's such a key thing for myself and Timmy just to, I suppose, uh, to get an awareness around why our life turned out the way it did, give us the vocabulary to, you know, express ourselves and to pass on the message. But, um, and Timmy speaks a lot about his, um, started out his education journey within the prison. But will you talk to us about maybe some of the educational supports that are in prison at the moment? I know there's a... A great initiative there through Menut University and a kind of collection of universities there directly targeted at people that have been in prison as well. Yeah, I suppose the first thing I'll say is it's the most shocking statistic I ever um, can share in relation to people who are in our care today. And that's the average school leaving age of everybody in custody today is 14. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you, the junior soft, like. if you disengage with mainstream education at 14, you're more likely to hang around the streets. You're more likely, um, you know, to be used by gangs, to be influenced negatively. And um, you're more likely to get into trouble um, and you're more likely then um, or, or more unlikely to be able to find employment um, or, or further education opportunities. So, I mean, for me, that's an incredibly stark statistic. So what we do in our schools is quite incredible because it's not I mean, it's adult education, but it's not a second chance for many people. It's a first chance. Um, and I suppose from listening to different people's stories within the education centers, what's really clear is that there is a huge amount um, of undiagnosed learning disabilities, um, you know, within the prisoner population. And, and I suppose that's part of the reason why the person might have disengaged with mainstream education, that they have an educational disability. They're masking that disability or the learning disability by, you know, assuming a persona and um, that leads them to get into trouble in school that leads them to be excluded and then takes them down a particular pathway so i mean education is really really important uh, we have incredible education units so i'm so proud and spend a lot of time in our schools so we've got 220 whole-time equivalent teachers directly funded by the department of education to run adult learning centers in all of our institutions and i think what what what, what stands out for me every time i visit a school is that they're such vibrant um centers of, of learning um, there's such a positive attitude amongst everybody and mm. um, there's no judgment and um, you know the, the, there's no judgment in any way in terms of your offense in terms of your level of ability in terms of the studies that you want to pursue and really is an environment where you're trying to grow and nurture and develop and um, you know people's innate skills and abilities and for me when we look at some of the incredible work that's done within our schools I find it really sad that somebody you know comes to custody to find that they have an incredible talent in relation yeah. to art an incredible talent in relation to music creative writing incredible talent in relation to woodwork and it's the first time that those talents have been identified and it's in an environment a prison environment where those talents have been nurtured and um, so i think education has a huge role to play and um, as i said earlier in terms of breaking that pipeline between school and imprisonment but the work that's done within our education centers is incredible last week i was at an open university a graduation in the Midlands prison where somebody graduated with a degree from the Open University and there were 17 other Open University students in the room who were investing huge time and energy in terms of using as education as a way to see a different future for themselves. So um, there are a huge array of subjects um, on offer, really tailored for um, the needs and I suppose the interests of people um, who are within our care. Our teachers are absolutely incredible. Our school officers are absolutely incredible. And then the results that are achieved are absolutely incredible. And I think it's not just 
you know, the piece of paper that you get. Um, it's a love of lifelong learning that you pass on to your children. It's the recognition that education, you know, is an equaler and can give you so many opportunities in the future in terms of further education when you leave our custody um, or further training. So I mentioned earlier, we've been doing quite a lot of work with Minister Simon Harris, who really gets this and understands this. And one of the things we'd like to do is to look at providing apprenticeship training um, within custody. So there is a huge demand for apprentices, um, you know, right across, um, you know, the economy. Um, we have huge work training and education capabilities within our institutions. And what we'd like to be doing is actually providing pre-apprenticeship training. So we do a lot in terms of work training at the moment. Um, but it doesn't necessarily lead to something. And I suppose, you know, while people are gaining, you know, qualifications, it would be great to do the pre-apprenticeship training so that people have a really clear pathway to go out onto an apprenticeship where an employer has been found, you know, while you're in custody to take you on. And, and, and I think that's really important in terms of third level education. I mean, there are really some incredible leaders in this field. You mentioned Maynooth University. I'd also mentioned Cork University and uh, Munster Technological, Technological University. Yeah. And, and, and I, I visited there actually um, this year. Um, They're doing the cookery the, yeah, course. Yeah, so, yeah. So, it, so it's incredible. So what we have are third level institutions who see the ability and the talent and the skill and the potential of people in custody and who are willing to give people that second chance, but not just give people a second chance, but to give people additional supports mm. so that they can be successful and they can see third level education as, as, as an opportunity for them. So and um, there's much more I think we can do within this space. And I certainly think a lot of our focus um when we're engaging with the Department of Education um, and SOLAS and, as I say, um, the, 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 the Department of Higher Education um, and Skills is around seeing pathways for people. Um, so there's no it's not just good enough to do great work within, um, you know, your time in prison. You need to see a pathway and a really clear pathway for you, um, you know, into third level education or training in the community. And as I say, for the first time ever, the new national um, access plan for higher education specifically mentions people in contact with the criminal justice and, as a vulnerable and a marginalised group. So I think we're certainly well on the way in relation to that. And I think there'll be some interesting developments over the next few years. You mentioned something there, and I think it's very, it's very important to re-mention it. It's about the, the apprenticeship schemes. I think that would be absolutely amazing within the prison system, firstly, because a lot of the lads who who haven't been ever educated, you, you do need a junior sort in, in a lot of these areas to get a trade. Maybe in electrics you, and plumbing, you might need to leave and sort the equivalent in maths and English or whatever. You know, I'm not sure there's ways around that too. But... I think one of the most important factors is a lot of the lads, they're practically learners. They learn visually with their hands and they're, they're great. A lot of, like, including myself, because I'm a carpenter by trade. Uh, academically, wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't ever, it wasn't something that I enjoyed sitting in the classroom and stuff. No, I can, I can manage it and I'm able for it, but back in the day, I, I couldn't. But I think, Starting up an initiative like that where you have woodwork, maybe basic plumbing, electrics within these classrooms, masonry, plastering, yeah. painting. Yeah. These are things these are these could be massive for even the workforce that, that we have at the moment where we're so behind in construction, we're missing massive uh, there's massive gaps in trades at the moment. You know, so I think what you could definitely onto something there. If 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 you could have further talk or, uh, with with the minister and stuff like that, and but there is the education aspect of it as well, where you need a certain level of education to get onto it. Yeah, and I, I think that might help motivate people. So if you see something really practical, so for for a lot of people, doing a junior cert or a leaving cert isn't, do you know what I mean, like an end in and of itself. But if you could see that doing your junior cert. Um, slowly and incrementally with support could lead to, um, you know, an actual apprenticeship when you leave custody, um, you know, which will lead to employment, which will give you stability, which will give you, you know, housing and all of those other opportunities. I think it could be seen as a really good motivation. Um, and, and certainly um, we're making good progress in relation to that. So we have lots of opportunities for people in custody. And I suppose for me, what we're now trying to see is how we can get people to leverage that opportunity that they've taken to bring with them into um, you know, the, 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 the community when they leave the walls mm -hmm. um, and go back into the community. And there's huge potential there. There's hope. There's hope. And there's as hope, I say, like, our prisons are places of hope and opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That's, a, that's a big deal. Like if you're going into, if into prison with no 
no no job opportunities or anything like that, no skills or anything, and you're doing a three or four, five-year sentence or whatever, and you're going in there and you get a bit of an education, enough to get you a, a trade, and you're leaving prison with a way yeah. of financially supporting yourself and your family. Yeah. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. And it doesn't even need to be a full apprenticeship. So I know we're, yeah. we've been talking to the National Construction Skills Centre, which is based in Offaly, and they do tickets to, for, to drive machinery on a building site. But some of those ticket courses, maybe two or three days or maybe a week. Mm. Um, and there's certainly there's a huge willingness on their part to work with us to give opportunities for people, because we know, um, you know, that if you go out with a, a job that's been secured, there's huge potential. And I think you mentioned the Open Door Initiative in Cork Prison, yeah. um, where uh, Munster Technological M to you, yeah. a Munster Technological University came in and thought a culinary skills program, um, you know, within Cork Prison. We then invited restaurateurs and hotel owners from across the county in. They were served an incredible dinner. But a lot of the guys who did that course got job offers, offers on the night and have gone, um, you know, out into employment. And it is a game changer. So if we can uh, really focus our attention on building those pathways for people to go back to the community and not see our job as stopping at the gate, I think we can really help people um, you know, fulfil their potential. So they're realising their potential while they're in custody with us, but fulfilling that potential means having access to employment on release, having access to the ability and the opportunity to go on to third level education mm. um, or further adult education or training. So yeah. You said something there as well earlier on about um, people that are educated, they kind of pass it on to their children. I remember when my dad was in prison, he did a open university course in the training unit, Mount Joy. It was a sociology it was criminal criminology and social policy and when he was inside my mum did a degree in CIT in community development no it didn't happen for me straight away but it wasn't by coincidence that I studied both of them at bachelor's and master's degree so like giving people access to education while they're inside is not soft on crime that's how you actually prevent future crime and break Absolutely. the cycle Absolutely, absolutely. And I say that every time I talk to our teachers, um, that it's not just the student in the room that you're helping. Yeah. Instilling that love of lifelong learning and lighting that fire, um, you know, and that passion. Um, and I think you, you said yourself in terms of engaging in an education, learning about yourself and yeah. why you've ended up where you are, um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's really powerful, actually, in terms of yeah. agency and yeah. taking control of your destiny. Yeah. Um, so education has an incredible role to play. Because then you learn, process. like, Maybe I'm not a scumbag. Maybe I'm not a junkie. Maybe, maybe all this stuff contributed my behaviour. And then when you're around that, it's like, well, maybe I can have a better life now exactly. because I'm not an inherently bad human being, even exactly. though I've been taught that all my life. And you know, you just get it more critically mm -hmm. on your environment, you know, and start joining the dots. And I always found education to be a personal development tool as well, learning about psychology, philosophy, sociology, being able to put the dots together and kind of look at my family, my own life, my community zoom out look at europe and mm -hmm. you know geop geopolitics and how all that contributes to life outcomes for individual people so um, but also the piece around self-esteem and self-worth and i yeah. think that's as valuable as yeah. the certificate and um, that you might achieve at the end is actually realizing you have a talent and realizing you have a skill and realizing that you can achieve um, and for many people where they get a qualification um you know within prison it's the first time and um, they've had a qualification and i love when the families come in so i met the family of that guy who qualified or who graduated from open university and how proud they were um of, of his achievement we had gashka gold winners uh, gold medal winners there and the dad of one of the guys there and just so how proud yeah. um, f of that achievement and it's an achievement against all the odds because I know when I was talking to the guys in the room it would be easy to spend your time on the landing it would be easy to you know watch TV and play computer games so it takes a huge amount of personal motivation to get up every day and go to school and to stick with it mm -hmm. and even when things become difficult um, you know or, or, or when there are problems is to stay with it that level of personal motivation um, and as I say that fire then in terms of, of, of continuing your education I think is one of the most important things we can give people while they're with us. You mentioned there, and I just want to reiterate, it's about the teachers. The teachers within the prison are absolutely Incredible. amazing. The way the level they meet you, where they meet you around your education, you know, they bring you right back and they mind you, they don't push you, they take you at your own level. And I also, like, I, I got very emotional at the Goshka Awards because one of my teachers from the Midlands prison actually came to the event and, um, She's my, my first, I always thought of her because I kept some of the books that she gave me around um, vowels and stuff, reading even the alphabet, even learning all these different things. And I still have them at home. And um, 
I every time I see them books, I kind of think of her and where she met me at the level she met me and some all the other lads as well. Like I was never met at that level before by anybody and it was it was it was such a beautiful thing for me to experience. But I didn't realise it at the time because I was going through so many different things. It wasn't until after prison I was able to look back and I said, Jesus Christ, they were amazing. Mm -hmm. The way they actually treated me. It was the first time I probably was never judged on who I was, mm -hmm. you know, by these people. Never judged like I'm sitting inside in prison and I wasn't even judged. They were treating me with respect. They'd bring in the odd few treats here and there and there. I might get a packet of biscuits or something like that. And that was even a big deal. You know, a cup of tea in the pack. It was a big deal. It showed, like, they actually, they actually give a fuck. Do you know, they actually care about you. And I learned so much from the teachers. And I, I, I just felt the need to, to commend the teachers that are in, in working for the, the prison service because you do a fantastic job. They're, they're really, really incredible. Like, really, really incredible. But for me, I suppose, the question it prompts is, why does it take somebody coming in to contact with the criminal justice system and coming into prison to be able to engage... No with the education system and what is it we need to do, you know, within our communities to support vulnerable children. Um, and actually, after this uh, recording, I'm meeting Senator Lynn Iran and we're trying to work together on a project at the moment, which is around trying to do an educational assessment um, of everybody coming into custody between 18 and 24 so that we have a real benchmark in terms of um, learning disabilities. Mm. And, and I suppose, again, it prompts the question, how is it you end up in custody in your 20s or your 30s with undiagnosed dyslexia or undiagnosed ADHD? Mm. And how do we work within our communities and work within our education system in our communities at primary level and maybe before primary level to make sure that people are given those supports and given that equality of opportunity in terms of nurturing and growing the innate talents that they have. Yeah. I think I think having an educational psychologist within the prisons, each prison is just as important as having a clinical psychologist in there because what they do for the lads as well is they give the lads an understanding of why they might think in a certain way or act in a certain way and they also even for myself, when I got assessed at the age of 36, the belief, all my core beliefs that I was stupid mm -hmm. and thick and no good and mm -hmm. there was something wrong with my brain, they all kind of just fizzed away once I got that assessment done. And I know a lot of the lads inside in the prison system, in, inside in the prisons, have the same ideas and beliefs about themselves. And yeah. that's why a lot of them won't go to education because of that. Because yeah. of, Reading is not for me, or education is not for me. It's, it's just not. But if these assessments are done and it's explained that, oh, you, you've a thing called dyscalculia, uh, dysgraphia, you're dyslexic, or, or you know, um, that'll help them massively to understand themselves and to say, you know what, I'm going to walk now and tell the teacher right this, and she'll tweak the learning then around that absolutely. learning difference yeah. to be able to help me. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. And we spend a lot of time thinking about so the people who go to school are the people who are on that journey, you know, and actually want to um, make a difference. How do we reach then the people who aren't engaging in education? And on any given day, 40 percent of the population are engaging in education, which I think is a very high statistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'd like to do more. So during COVID, we introduced the Incel TV channel. And actually, that's now transitioning to a blended learning model. Um, so the ETBs in Dublin have developed 150 courses that can be played through the incel television channel and there's an accompanying booklet and um, that people can do within their cells so i suppose it's about trying to see how do we target the people within our community and um, our prison community who aren't engaging in education because they are the people you're right do you know what i mean like that whose confidence we need to build um, and who we need to to, to, to help um, make that step to go up to the school and again i think that's where and um, the peer-led approach works really really well and i think we'd certainly like to, to exploit that more we know from the work the Red Cross do and um, that they have a huge potential to positively influence and um, you know other people within the environment we know that people who are engaging in, in education have a huge potential you know to positively motivate other people so certainly all the time we're thinking about how do we get to the people and um, you know who actually aren't engaging in, in in the school at the moment and certainly the incel and um, television channel is the beginning I think of a modernization program around incel learning for us and um, but it offers people 
people an opportunity, um, you know, within their cell, um, you know, to maybe have a look at what's on offer and have a look and actually realise that, um, you know, it's not, um, you know, rocket science and that, that actually there are things maybe that would spark their interest. And, and I think it's important for us to make sure then that all, everything we're offering is of interest to, 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 to people because there's no point in offering, you know, just the traditional leaving cert subjects or the junior cert subjects. And that's right. not what our schools are doing. The focus is really around um, QQI. It's around short, um, you know, programs where you can have an achievement over an eight week period. And there's a huge amount of support that's available um, through us. Yeah, and uh, it, it's great as well with the, the Prison TV channel because we were delighted to get our podcast on the Prison TV channel for the very reason you spoke about there. Because there will be like 40% of people going to the school, but there'll be a lot of prisoners won't go to the school. But if they might hear me or Timmy or somebody else, they can relate with on the podcast from, from their cell and identify and then think, all right, I, I have a lot of similarities there and they went to school and they got on, so why can't I? You might spark something, Absolutely. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it might give them a little bit of courage to just put their name down for the school the next Absolutely. morning, you know? So that's always the motivation for us. Just just put your name down for the school and see where it goes. It yeah. might go nowhere. Yeah. Just give yourself a little try. Yeah, and there are lots of people who go up to the school and maybe don't take any classes. Um, and that's okay. You know, They might yeah. just take an art class, um, which is okay. You know, so, yeah. so whatever you're interested in, um, you know, there is a potential... Um, you know, support for you within the education um, unit in the prison. Yeah. And I would certainly encourage everybody, um, you know, to, 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 to go across that edge, you know, or to, to cross that line um, and to have faith in yourself because there is no doubt that everybody who's followed that pathway has found that they have incredible talents and yeah. incred incredible gifts um, that then are nurtured within that learning environment. Yeah. Shania? Shania. Believe it, there, can't. We didn't get past the first question. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> 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 Thanks for your time. Thanks that for your time. Was, that was talking, absolutely yeah. brilliant, and it's great to get the perspective of, of yourself and yeah. and the initiatives that you have in your head, and, and that you're you, you're working around tables to get get into the prison systems to benefit prisoners. Yeah. You know, which so like will we, then benefit really society. Say, but like we're building our, so we're working on a new strategy at the moment. If, if there's, still on, oh, I'm can, still on. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, well, yeah, I'll keep on. here all day now. Yeah, but well, we are working on our, our new strategy at the moment. But what we're trying to do is to put the service user at the center. So for too long within our, um, you know, prison system, um, you know, we haven't. And, and if we were a healthcare system, we'd have the patient at the centre. Yeah. Um, if we were an education um, establishment, we'd have the student at the centre. But we haven't always had um, the people in our care at the centre oh, yeah. of everything we do. So for our new strategy, it's very much built around um, our service users and effectively everything that we do as an organisation, we should be able to relate back to mm -hmm. delivering better outcomes for people in our care. So I think that is quite a shift mm -hmm. um, and I think that's quite a powerful shift and it's building on what we learned during COVID, um, I think, which is that we can set our mind to do anything or sorry, we can do anything if we set our mind to it. Mm. And like at the beginning of COVID, I set my mind to keeping COVID out of our prisons and people laughed at me. But actually between March and October, we didn't have a single case within our prison system yeah. because it was down to the termination of the people living and working in the prisons that they would all work together with a singular aim of keeping COVID out. So I think we've 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 demonstrated that we can rally the whole organization um, around delivering something really, really significant. Actually, somebody said to me that before like we got COVID here around March, but somebody said to me that the prison service were actually preparing for COVID even Christmas beforehand because yeah. they, they'd see what was coming down the path. Absolutely. So we do, and I suppose we're a learning organisation and things go wrong in prisons and inevitably things go wrong. But I think yeah. what's really important for us is we learn from, from what went wrong and we do better in the future. So we had a number of TB outbreaks in our prisons down through the years. And unfortunately, you know, both staff and people in our care were exposed to TB, which is obviously mm -hmm. what we don't want to happen. And because of that, we built a whole infection control system within our prisons. We were ironically training our staff in donning and doffing of PPE. Uh, we had really good infection control training that was being given to all staff. We had a national infection control manager. Um, we had the Red Cross doing things like hand washing, um, you know, within the environment. So while we were a really vulnerable congregated setting and where you would have expected to have seen, you know, huge outbreaks mm. in relation to COVID because we were taken seriously the lessons we've learned in relation yeah. to previous you infection well diseases. We were well on the way. And at one stage we were giving PPE to hospitals because we actually started buying yeah. uh, PPE. I, I got a call from my infection control manager, I think on New Year's Eve um, to say, I'm looking at what's happening in China and I'm not happy with it. And can I go ahead and start doing refresher training in terms of donning and doffing a PPE? And can we start building our supplies? Um, 
things. So it just shows you that if you're a learning organization and if you reflect on what's gone wrong and if you learn the lessons and if you implement those lessons, then, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in such a stronger position for whatever might come um, in the future. So we've learned the lessons um, of COVID. And I think the other thing to say is that, like, we did a remarkable job in relation to COVID, but that's not to say there wasn't a huge impact on everybody. And I really am cognizant of that. So we got the Red Cross to do a piece of research with people in the progression unit to understand the impact of particularly the restrictions around isolation and quarantine. Mm -hmm. And I brought my full senior management team who were the decision makers during COVID to get the feedback um, into the progression unit um, from those Red Cross volunteers. And it was such a sobering moment because we were really clear. We made the right decisions at the right time and we had the right effect, but we didn't think enough about the impact on the individual yeah, who has yeah. been subjected to those, um, you know, restrictions. Two and weeks, I think that was, quarantine yeah, was... I think that was the case though right across society. But what we're now doing actually is we're reflecting on um, what we did and we had very much an infection control led model um, of, 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 of pandemic management. And now we've decided actually we need to have a mental health model for infection control into the future. So working with our psychology and our infection control team, we're reviewing all of the policies and procedures that we implemented yeah. to make sure that the next pandemic we don't you know do what we did the last time but we get the same success but while having a real focus on how we keep services open as opposed to what restrictions we implement to keep people safe so and um, i think that's really really important i think it's also important to recognize you know the huge impact it did have on people mm -hmm. the impact it had in relation to family relationships in particular and yeah. um, but there's some really positive things that have come out of covid in my view and i suppose the realization when somebody is behind the door how do you get them to make a phone call and mm -hmm. um, so at one stage i'd be visiting prisons and the landing we just have wires crisscrossed because we were running wires to run put under doors to give phones in so people could have contact with their family so what we've decided now is to put a phone in everybody's cell um, and we've about 2,000 phones installed now um, so that people can make calls from their cells but it's more than that so my ambition is really clear that families can phone in so it's no good if you have a six minute phone call a day or two six minute phone calls that you ring your children and they're at sports or they're at an activity or they're asleep or they're doing the homework or they're playing with their friends or that your partner do you know what I mean? Like might be busy, might be cooking the dinner, um, you know, might be working, might be shopping. So like the, 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 the ambition is that families can ring in. So families can ring in directly into a cell. Uh, we're hoping three times a day and um, three 10 minute calls. And again, that's just about normalizing yeah. um, contact with families, because we know if you don't maintain your contact with your family and if you don't, I mean, if you can't actively parent your children, well, then when you go back out to that family, there's going to be very significant issues and challenges for you in terms of fitting in. So um, we learn the lessons um, and then we try to put our mistakes right um, by, by doing better in the future. I know the Dylan's Cross Project here on the north side as well. They do great work with families as Incredible well. Incredible work. I've and visited them. Yeah, and it's very important that um, it's to keep that family unit together because that is proven to reduce uh, offending rates, you know, when people get out. But if they're disconnected from the family, they're far more likely to end up back inside uh, for repeat offending. Absolutely. And I certainly as part of a new strategy, families will feature um, quite a lot. And we're just about to appoint a family links officer, um, you know, that would be taking a strategic look at how we support um, family relationships. And there's a, there's a lot we do, but there's a huge amount more that we can do. And we're certainly determined to do that. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of great stuff happening and we're delighted to hear from, from yourself. So thanks for your time this morning. Thank you. And uh, so we'll probably definitely stay in contact anyway because we've similar kind of views and ethos and passions. So it's great to talk to you. Thank Thanks, you so James. much, Karen. Thanks, Timmy. Thank you. Thank you.